Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. The Bharatiya Janata Party under Narendra Modi has not only embraced B.R. Ambedkar as an icon, but considers him a special hero. The Prime Minister has specifically said that he is an Ambedkar Bhakt. So today we ask, will B.R. Ambedkar approve of and even agree with many of the things that BJP has said and many that it's done? A book that's been published recently clearly suggests the answer is no. Here is the book, it's called Ambedkar, it's a life and its author, Shashi Tharoor, is my guest today. Shashi Tharoor, as I said in that introduction, the BJP under Narendra Modi not only has embraced Ambedkar as an icon, but considers him a special hero. In 2015, the Prime Minister said, Baba Sahib Ambedkar is an inspiration not just for one community, but the entire world. The next year, in 2016, the Prime Minister declared that he was an Ambedkar Bhakt. But your book clearly shows that on critical issues, what the, BBC, what the BJP says and does is almost contrary to what Ambedkar stood for, advocated and practiced. I'll come to details in a moment's time. But let me put this to you. Would you agree that there's a gulf of difference between Ambedkar's beliefs and the BJP's practice and rhetoric? There is, and you're quite right. You say that would Ambedkar have approved the BJP? The answer is very clearly no. But does the BJP approve of Ambedkar despite what uh, Prime Minister Modi appears to have, have said and done? And by the way, it's continued since the quotes you gave. They have actually managed to organize a social justice week uh, around Ambedkar Saab's birthday this year and last. So they're really now heading into complete Ambedkar uh, worship territory. Uh, the fact still is that um, if they actually took the trouble to read what Ambedkar had to say about, for example, Hinduism, uh, as, as a religion, as a social practice, and so on, I think the BJP would have tremendous difficulty approving of it themselves. Let's, in fact, take up some of those issues one by one, and I'll start with Hinduism. The BJP is committed, as you know, to a majoritarian view of India, That's which right. gives priority to Hindus. Ambedkar, on the other hand, believed that it would be a disaster for the country. This is what he wrote about Hindu Raj. If Hindu Raj does become a fact, it will no doubt be the greatest calamity for this country. No matter what the Hindus say, Hinduism is a menace to liberty, equality, and fraternity. On that account, it is incompatible with democracy. Hindu Raj must be prevented at any cost. Now, this is a clear slap in the BJP's face. Before we talk about the embarrassment for the BJP, can you explain what brought Ambedkar to this conclusion about Hinduism? Well, you see, he was massively um, against, obviously, the caste system, not just untouchability, which he wanted, of course, annihilated, but against the very social order that legitimized untouchability. And he did not draw a distinction between Hindu society and Hindu faith or Hindu spirituality. He felt that the one justified the other, and that as far as he was concerned, Hindu society had to be completely destroyed. In fact, he actually even, even argued that the state should regulate the theology and practice of Hinduism. He was that angry with the, with the Hindu, Hindu uh, faith. Now, Ambedkar had this very strong view because he saw the social discrimination that the practice of Hinduism inflicted upon his own 
people, his own family, his own friends, and he felt it was monstrously unjust. But you're right, a lot of his, his language is very, very strong. There was no BJP in those days, but there were people both in the Congress, which is then, then the, the Nationalist Movement Congress, and beyond the Congress in bodies like the Hindu Mahasabha and later the Bharatiya Jansan, whom um, Ambedkar violently disagreed with in terms of precisely this, their reverence for Hinduism, even that reference that you read out to liberty, equality, and fraternity. It was a very conscious choice by Ambedkar to situate the wellsprings of democracy, not in ancient Hindu philosophy, as some others were trying to do during those years, but in the French Revolution. So he said, liberty, equality, and fraternity, because that phrase came from there. Uh, and he did, was willing to extend this to the idea of fraternity in Buddhism, but not in Hinduism. In fact, the embarrassing thing which we've established is the BJP which supports and stands for Hindu Raj and has embraced Ambedkar as an icon and a hero, and the Prime Minister calls himself a buck, have actually chosen a man who thinks that Hindu Raj would be a calamity. He actually says it is incompatible with democracy. It must be prevented at any cost. But the embarrassment for the BJP, the mismatch between their view and position and Ambedkar's beliefs actually goes considerably further because your book shows that Ambedkar probably had a de deep dislike for Hinduism. He actually felt that it was unfair to Dalits, his people, and would never give them justice, which is why in 1956 he converted to Buddhism. And then he wrote, and I believe this is in the annihilation of caste, Hindu civilization is a diabolical contrivance to enslave humanity. Its proper name should be infamy. infamy. Yes, now, I mean, that is deeply scathing, and either the BJP is unaware of it, which would make the BJP look very stupid, or it's deliberately ignoring it because for expedient and convenient reasons, it wants to consider him an icon and the Prime Minister wants to claim he's a bug. Which of the two do you think it is? I, I think it's probably the latter. There's a deep-seated cynicism, I find, in a lot of the BJP's politics. They have decided it would be expedient to embrace Dr. Ambedkar as part of the political coalition building that they're about. Uh, they want to create a Hindu majority. And since Dalits represent at least 16.6% .6 of the vote in some calculations, that is a substantial vote that they want to incorporate into, a, into their Hindu majority. And therefore, it is not convenient to recall some of the things Ambedkar said. It, they can only confine themselves to praising the things Ambedkar, Ambedkar has done. Now, the difficulty with all of this is that Ambedkar's critique was often expressed in temperate terms. In my own book, I do say that I, think, I don't think he's being very fair to Hinduism uh, because there's a very sweeping denunciation of the faith and of Hindu society, which he, he admits of no compromise in his language. Uh, but nonetheless, he has said all of these things, and there are more quotes in my and book. And meant it truly and, and sincerely. And meant it over a period of decades, and he got more and more angry with the passage of time until finally he Which quit is the why fight. it's so strange that a party that supports and defends and holds up Hinduism as a virtue should consider this man an icon, and the Prime Minister should publicly say, I'm an Ambedkar Bhakt. I mean, are you an Ambedkar <laughs> Bhakt of a man who says that, in fact, Hinduism is a diabolical contrivance? A man who says that Hinduism is a menace to liberty, equality, fraternity, and incompatible with democracy. I mean, the Prime Minister has put himself in an invidious position. If people care to read, but do people. I think what the BJP appreciates is that Ambedkar as a symbol, they can arrogate or appropriate to themselves. The content of all that he's written will not be read by 99% of the BJP's followers. That's essentially what they rely upon. But in fact, Ambedkar's position is even more embarrassing, if that's possible. Not only does he seem to dislike Hinduism, he clearly, according to your book, seems to dislike Hindus as well. And once again, I think I'm quoting from the Annihilation of Caste. This is what he says. Hindus are a race of pygmies and dwarfs, stunted in stature and wanting in stamina. And then he adds, there can be a better or worse Hindu, but, but a, a good, good Hindu, Hindu cannot, be. cannot be. Now, I mean, if anyone else had said that, the BGP would be incandescent with rage. But in Ambedkar's case, they're either unaware or they've forgotten and forgiven, or no, they've conveniently chosen to ignore it. They've conveniently chosen to ignore it. See, Ambedkar did express himself quite intemperately on a number of topics, and particularly on this one. And I would say that uh, the BJP thinks it's far more useful to attach themselves to the coattails of this iconic figure than to parse in detail 
the content of his utterances. And that's clearly lying behind it. Even the, your expression of the Prime Minister's expression that he's an Ambedkar Bhakt. The one thing Ambedkar warned the nation against was Bhakti in politics. Absolutely. He and said you can't worship people. I, I'll come to that in a moment, time because that's one of the further gulfs between the BGP and Ambedkar that I want to explore with you. But I want to first point this out. The huge difference between Ambedkar and the BGP over the issue of Hinduism almost exploded two weeks ago when Rajendra Pal Gupta publicly recited Ambedkar's famous 22 vows That's right. and the BJP descended on him like a ton of bricks. But I mean, all he was doing was fulfilling and repeating what their icon had himself said. It's not just that. I think Rajendra Pal Gautam, if I'm not mistaken, is himself a Buddhist. Yeah, he He's is somebody who, 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 has, who has repeated those vows in utter sincerity as Dr. Ambedkar and perhaps half a lakh people did at the same, uh, at the same occasion in Nagpura Diksha Bhumi. And the fact is that, you know, it's very curious. Hindutva has accommodated itself to the Ambedkar conversion by arguing that when he had a choice of various faiths to convert to, Ambedkar still anchored himself in an Indic religion. And the Hindutva view is that Buddhism is really a form of Hinduism in India. It's nothing more than, say, Protestantism versus Catholicism, uh, that sort of Which relationship. Which the Buddhists vehemently Disagree of with course them. they would, but the point is, I'm just saying from their point of view, therefore, the conversion was not such a major act of apostasy uh, because it was to Buddhism. Or had it been to Jainism, the same thing would have been fine. But what has to be objectionable is calling Hindus pygmies, calling them lacking in stature, calling them dwarfs. I mean, that is objectionable. Uh, well, look, uh, Ambedkar, as I said, was occasionally intemperate in his choice of language. Uh, and, and, and yet Mr. Modi is a disciple of a man who thinks Hindus are pygmies and dwarfs. dwarfs. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's for Mr. Modi to explain. But I will say that as far as the, uh, as far as the, the question of the conversion is concerned, the BJP and the RSS, by the way, have been able to reconcile themselves to it. A couple of RSS uh, intellectuals have even written books on it. Only on the spurious grounds that Buddhism is in fact a form of Hinduism and no oh, different of than Indic Protestantism religion. from exactly. Catholicism. But by the way, even Protestants wouldn't accept that their religion is identical to or the same. They would vehemently say it's a different faith. Well, you know, the interesting thing Sati is that with the, the key distinction in Hindutva, though, is, is not over theology. It's whether your Punya Bhumi is in India or abroad. So for their point of view, if your holy land is yeah. India, but then you are within, within the family as it But we're well. getting diverted. Let's come back to the Gulf. And anyway, so, so I'm just saying for them, Buddhism is not in the same category, say, converting to Islam or Christianity or, or Judaism would have been. Let me wrap up this particular section of the interview before I take up yet another Gulf that separates Ambedkar from the Bichi by asking you this. Given Ambedkar's views about Hinduism and Hindu Raj, how would he view the vision that the Modi government or the BJP has for India? I think there's absolutely no question that he would not share the view. If you, if you were to read his overall views of politics, of economics, of society, he was um, in very many ways an extremely original thinker. But he had strong lashings of, of what one might really call Marxism. He had a, not that he confined himself to class and as Marxists do, he, he did believe that the problem with communism was that it overlooked caste. But nonetheless, he had a very sort of left of center view of society and economics. He certainly had very little patience for the kind of uh, 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 economic policies the BJP government is following today. He had no patience at all for exalting the Hindu faith as a pattern. In fact, he stressed that in India there would be no state religion. It was very important to him that individuals should be free to practice as they wish and to propagate uh, their own faiths. And finally, he would have had very, very strong objection to the encroachment by the BJP government on civil liberties uh, or laws like the UAPA and so on would have been absolutely, it would have appalled Ambedkar. So he would have been a very strong opponent of the BJP. I believe he certainly would have been. Connected to Ambedkar's views about Hinduism and Hindu Raj are his very strong views about minorities and how minorities should be treated. Yeah. In a very famous speech that he made at the Constituent Assembly in November 1948, this is what he said. The minorities in India have agreed to place their existence in the hands of the majority. They have loyally accepted the rule of the majority, which is basically a communal majority and not a political majority. And then he added, it is for the majority to realize its duty 
not to discriminate against minorities. I want to repeat that because I think it's such an important sentence. That's right. It is for the majority to realize its duty not to discriminate against minorities. Not only does the BJP not accept that it has such a duty, but it blatantly and repeatedly flouts does. it. Yeah. In fact, I, I quoted it precisely because this, this, this bit has so much of resonance for today's politics. There's a lot of what Ambedkar has written and said which really could open the eyes of people who are facing up to the contemporary realities of our, of our politics and for which the BJP is responsible. And minority rights is one of those fundamental ones, as indeed are the entire question of individual rights versus communal ones. I mean, Ambedkar had come squarely down in favor of individual rights. And what we're seeing with the BJP is a, a return in many ways to seeing communities as targets of government policy. So when the BJP refers to Muslims, as Babar ki Olaag. That's right. When or the Yogi ban or the talks NRC, them and calls exactly. them Abba Jan. When the Home Minister says go to Pakistan, Ambedkar would be appalled. He would, absolutely. And the CAA, for example, the Citizenship Amendment Act, which very clearly is intended to target one community, all of these things he would have found completely unacceptable. And debt, this is a man that Mr. Modi says he is a bucks of. This is a man that the BJP holds up as an icon. I just want to point out to the audience that the differences are extreme. There's no sense in which Ambedkar would be even mildly sympathetic to the BJP's position on minorities. Well, I, I, would, I can't speak for the BJP's thinking on it, but I would say probably where they would say they have, they have departed from Ambedkar would be on the kinds of details that you have read out, the, the quotes and so on. But they would say they share his, his desire to see untouchability eradicated because, as you know, the RSS is now squarely on the bandwagon of no untouchability, of no uh, social discrimination. Mr. Mohan Bhagwat even made a statement recently saying that, that caste... But should... remember, Abedkar went one step beyond the eradication Much. of untouchability. He left Hinduism because he believed that Hinduism would never be kind, fair and just to Dalits. That's right. He said BJP that basically... could not go that far. That Varnashrama was, was absolutely fundamental to... To Hinduism and to, therefore he couldn't accept it. So the, the RSS tries to reconcile it in that way. And as I said, they've got a couple of their ideologues writing books about Ambedkar, and this is partially their argument. The other part of it, I think, is that it's pure political expediency, as you and I both, I think, concurred earlier in this conversation, because the BJP has a project of consolidating a political majority on a communal majority, to use Ambedkar's own language. And the communal majority of Hinduism, of Hindus, will never be 51% of all Hindus because there are lots of Hindus who disagree with the Hindutva project. So getting as many Dalits on board this project is absolutely indispensable once again, to getting to that 51%. Once again, the BJP has embraced him for expedient reasons, for That's political right. reasons, Correct. not because they actually believe what he says. That's in right. fact, they'd be deeply opposed to it That's and right. embarrassed when it is raised and put to their face that actually the man you call an icon has said X, Y, and Z. But Ambedkar goes one step further. In that critical speech at the Constituent Assembly in November 1948, he actually issued a warning. He said, the minorities are an explosive force, which if it erupts, can blow up the whole fabric of the state. Now, once again, this is a warning, as far as the BJP is concerned, that has fallen on very deaf ears. That's because right. this party, and indeed this government, continually provoke and taunt the minorities, regardless of the fact that they might be playing with fire. Quite right. And in fact, the worry with this is that the minorities are even larger in numbers than they were when Ambedkar issued that warning. And if you alienate even 1%, for example, of our Muslim population today, you might be looking at a tinderbox. It's, it's extremely unfortunate that the BJP has not seen the danger to our society from their very, very short-term bigotry. Let's come to a third area where the yawning gulf between Ambedkar's beliefs and Ambedkar's statements and the BJP's practice becomes yet more embarrassing for the BJP. I'm talking about his very perceptive comments about how democracy could transform into a dictatorship even though you have regularly held presumably free and fair elections. Again, speaking in that Constituent Assembly speech of November 48, he said, it is quite possible for this newborn democracy to retain its form but give place to dictatorship in fact. If there was a landslide of popular support, the danger of that possibility becoming an actuality is much greater. And as you pointed out, he was also totally against bhakti worship and hero worship in politics. So would Ambedkar have actually looked at the way the BJP functions today and said, this government has actually realized my worst apprehension? I'm afraid he probably would have said that because that's exactly what we're all seeing. We're seeing as the 
Varieties of Democracy Institute in Sweden has concluded that you have an electoral autocracy. You win free and fair elections and then you proceed to be more and more authoritarian afterwards. And then having hollowed out the autonomous institutions that might have served as checks and balances on your regime, you then get re-elected again and again. I mean, this is not, frankly, uh, an unknown uh, recipe in other societies. But to see India heading down that path is extremely dismaying to all Democrats. The BJP and the government chafe at the bit when VDEM called them an electoral aut autocracy. Presumably, Ambedkar would have agreed with VDEM. He'd yeah. have said this is precisely what they are. This is exactly what he warned against in 48. Now, the BJP government is trying any which way to try and ensure that Hindi becomes the only official or national language in the country. And once again, as you point out in your book, Ambedkar had very strong feelings precisely about this. You write, and this time I'm quoting you, on the issue of language, Ambedkar expressed the view that the utility of a single language nationwide in the administration and the justice system required the continuation of English as a matter of practical convenience. And then you add, this implied that all the provinces, later we began to call them states, and the central government would continue to function and deal with each other in English. Now that would be an anathema to the BJP. That's and right. that's what Ambedkar wanted. That's right. But Ambedkar wanted it. In fact, I think in many ways, uh, that whole debate about national language and state languages and so on was really bubbling over at the time of the Constituent Assembly, and he took a very practical approach as a constitution maker. The BJP today, unfortunately, has become complacent about the issues. It's no longer a question of feeling you have a fragile state you need to knit together. It seems to be more about how to assert your dominance uh, over the state you already have. And that's why you have this rather uh, fatuous suggestion that Hindi should be made the only language of government and the only language of communication, which obviously it would be a recipe for, for disaster in terms of center-state relations and particularly uh, could threaten the unity of India because some states will simply refuse to accept that. And this is precisely the position of Ambedkar. And I'll point out again, a man they consider an icon, a man Mr. Modi claims to be a Bhakta. Once again, on the Hindi issue, he would be deeply opposed to what they intend. Exactly. So, in fact, if the BJP were really to be a devotees, uh, a devotees of Ambedkar, what they need to do is to actually heed his advice on all of these issues. Which they, that don't. Would be, that which they don't. If they did that, it might actually be good for all of us. You know, there's one other issue that I want to raise with you. There's another area where Ambedkar was not just perceptive and prescient, but actually many years in advance of his time. And I'm talking about what he had to say about the emerging differences between North India and South India, all of which we now fear could perhaps be inflamed by government policies such as GST, That's the right. imposition of Hindi, which we've been discussing, and whatever happens to the delimitation of constituencies after 2026. This is what Ambedkar wrote. There is a vast difference between the North and the South. The North is conservative. The South is progressive. The North is superstitious. The South is rational. The South is educationally forward. The North is educationally backward. The culture of the South is modern. The culture of the North is ancient. Now, this time, it's not just the BJP that doesn't understand and doesn't appreciate what Ambedkar was warning against, but probably most politicians in Northern India in Northern fall into India. that category. I'm afraid you're right. Yeah. And this is actually something that more and more people in the South are becoming conscious of. I was at a, a conclave a few weeks ago in Hyderabad in which uh, four state ministers and I were discussing nothing but precisely all this. There were not many references to Ambedkar, none at all perhaps. But the fact is, you're right, he was prescient in, in analyzing this and warning against it. And we have a government in Delhi that seems to be completely willfully blind to the dangers of alienating the South. Now, this time, it's not just a tinderbox that could blow up. It's a positive nuclear bomb because it could break up our country. Yes, but I certainly think nobody at the moment, not even in the South, uh, has any desire to break up the country. I think we're all committed deeply to the unity of India and to the success and prosperity but of India. But it all depends India. upon but how these the BJP policies, behaves. These policies will trigger an unfortunate backlash, I which mean, is the, avoidable and unnecessary. The imposition of Hindi will be a flame to this tinderbox. That would be. The adverse delimitation of constituencies to lessen the constituencies in states like Tamil Nadu and Kerala and increase, increase those them in UP and Bihar would be another flame to the tinderbox. And that seems to be set to happen anyway because the BJP has signaled in multiple forums that they will not renew 
the 91st Amendment when it lapses in 2026, at which point automatically in any case, the, uh, the redrawing of population boundaries, either within the existing total of 543 or more likely a larger figure, would essentially give the Hindi belt a two-thirds majority. Now, if they misuse that into amending the constitution, for example, and to declare a, a Hindi Rashtra or a Hindu Rashtra or both, then I'm afraid they're in for a very, very serious uh, reaction from the South. Now, this is an instance where a man who the BJP considers an icon is warning them in very stark terms about a danger that lies ahead, mm -hmm. and they're blind to it. Or they even are. worse, willfully blind to it. I fear they are. I'm coming right to the end. We've talked at great length about the many issues and areas where there's a yawning gulf between Ambedkar on the one hand and the BJP on the other. Mm -hmm. And yet the BJP considers him an icon. Mr. Modi says he's a bhakt. Would Ambedkar be proud of a bhakt like Narendra Modi? Well, he wouldn't want any bhakts at all. And he actually said that. He said the worst thing in our country is bhakti in politics. In fact, he, bhakti was one of the things about Hinduism that he didn't like. He says, we're constantly looking for a savior to come and rescue us and we, we worship somebody. We shouldn't do that. Uh, we should basically be interested in developing democratic institutions, have a strong sense of our individual rights. I mean, this, this is somebody who was a very profoundly committed Democrat in the old fashioned literal sense of the term. Can I put a twist into that answer? And I don't think that he's going, he would have much patience. Can I put a twist into that answer? You're talking about how Ambedkar didn't like the idea of bhakti, but he was talking about genuine bhakti, where the bhakt is genuinely a disciple and believes in what the person he holds up actually says. But in Mr. Modi's case, it's not genuine bhakti, it's convenience and expedience. No, because Mr. Modi clearly doesn't believe in what Ambedkar stood for. So true. here he would say, but, this is hypocrisy. But bhakti, as Ambedkar understood it also, is fundamentally uncritical. You worship, you don't engage critically anymore with the person. But you can't think, worship someone with whom you completely disagree. Mr. Modi <laughs> claiming I'm a bhakt is don't. being hypocritical. He's behaving expediently to delude Dalits into believing that in fact he's a follower when clearly he can't be. So in this instance, Presumably, Ambedkar will turn around and say to Mr. Modi, A, I don't like bhakti. But more importantly, your bhakti is hypocrisy. You're <laughs> using me to try and win votes. You don't believe in what I said. That's right. Well, I mean, the thing is, of course, Ambedkar said an awful lot. There's 17,500 pages of writings and speeches. So it's possible that people in the BJP could say, well, there's some, some things that we believe he overstated his point of view, but on others we agree. I mean, there's always ways we can rationalize this debate. I still believe, though, that a lot of what I've quoted Ambedkar as saying was so fundamental to his thought that to pretend that you can disagree with that and still be a, a, a bhakt of, of Ambedkar to is tie indeed, yourself up in knots. Is indeed hypocritical. Yeah. All right, Rashi Thrud, let's leave it there. I think we've exposed the yawning gulf that divides the BJP from the man they consider their icon, Ambedkar, that it can only be expedient and hypocritical to carry on claiming, I am a bhakt of the man. I'm afraid you're right, Karan. We'll probably have to leave it there, but do read. I'm urging your viewers to please read the rest of the book. There's a lot more to it than that. There you are. I'll hold up the book for the viewers. Shashid likes insisting and ensuring that you get a good look at the book. And it is one that I recommend because it's not a very long book either. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Karan. All the best. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.